Hello, viewers of Palestine Studies TV. My name is Lisa Hajar. I'm a sociology professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I was part of a panel that focused on the humanitarian present here at the Middle East Studies Association. And my paper is focuses basically bringing together several specific concepts. One of them is the concept of lawfare. It's a term that refers to the amalgamation of law and warfare, and it's come to refer mainly, or to be debated mainly around ideas of litigating the legality of war-making practices. And in many ways, Israel, um, Israeli officials and public opinion regard it as a negative phenomenon. The other issue that I focus on my paper particularly is targeted killing and the concept of looking at how Israel has interpreted its own legal rights and duties in the West Bank and Gaza since the beginning of the occupation to allow the state to do many things that would be regarded as illegal under international law and then interpret the law to make that that legal. And in the case of targeted killing, that is one where um, you know a decision written by the uh, Aharon Barak for the Israeli High Court of Justice came to it around the legality of targeted killing basically argued it's neither categorically legal or illegal. Uh, it, it depends, you know, after the fact on whether or not the policy was, you know, practiced with proportion and so on. That does not necessarily constitute a correct interpretation of international law, and many um, there have been a number of efforts to uh, prosecute Israelis responsible for some of the most devastating targeted killings in European courts on the basis of universal jurisdiction. And so I conclude with those th those examples of lawfare to seek justice for uh, people who've been, you know, particularly civilians who've been killed by this policy. so early and thanks to the Armley family and to Linda Butler and JPS for uh, allowing me to join uh, my, fe my <laughs> fellow panelists. Um, let me just start very briefly. I want to ask how many of you have heard or feel even a modicum of uh, understanding of what the word lawfare means? So not a huge amount to that. So the word lawfare um, basically is an amalgamation of law and warfare. It was coined in um, the year 2001 by an American who at the time was a colonel, Air Force colonel, and a um, staff lawyer, um, judge advocate. And he had coined the term uh, as a, he's a military guy, so sort of a military-centric understanding of the word, and it had a negative meaning to him at the time, and it was the argument that there's too much law in the middle of war. I mean, it's constraining military discretion, it's constraining executive discretion, and he thought that when too many people were thinking about whether or not the U.S. military, and he was referring at that time to the war in Kosovo um, and, the, and the first Gulf War, that, you know, too many people making arguments about exactly what um, Yao was talking about, that too many civilians are killed, is really has a constraining effect. So he criticized it as a, a manifestation of hyper-legalism. Now, that was in, at the very beginning of this uh, decade, in the beginning of this millennium. The word lawfare has really exponentially increased, at least among people who think about law and warfare. And in fact, Dunlap himself has come as a result, particularly in the context of the U.S. war on terror, to really endorse lawfare. Um, he's sort of shifted his position. But the, the critical debate about lawfare, in terms of what people think about how the law is used or putatively misused, really tends now, over this last decade, to focus on the legitimacy or the contested legitimacy of litigation, to try and sue, prosecute, or otherwise penalize state agents, government um, hired contractors, and others for engaging in violations of international law. And the, it, it, most commonly, the concept of lawfare um, is invoked around the U.S. war on terror and the Israeli-Palestinian 
conflict. And so, in fact, um, you know, in, in the Israeli context, both official discourse and public mainstream sentiment, which in Israel, uh, you know, sort of spans from the right to the less right, um, is this whole notion of uh, lawfare has been embraced as a, as a bad term, as one manifestation of the, de the efforts to delegitimize Israel, which is often, you know, said to be one marker of anti-Semitism. Um, and, you know, in the same odious company with boycott, divestment, and sanctions. I mean, in fact, there's something that was uh, created uh, last year called the Lawfare Project. I, you know, encourage you to go online and have a look at it. And it's basically like lawfare. It's the latest in asymmetrical warfare, and it must be countered, you know, tactically, etc. So the Lawfare Project and this kind of negative understanding of lawfare is one that is very um, brings together in, in multiple ways official Israeli and official American and kind of mainstream, you know, war-supporting Americans and Israelis. For that very reason, and particularly around the question of litigation, I'll, I'll come to that, that's be the heart of my paper, I love lawfare. I love it. I love the word. I love everything about it. And I remember when um, we were at, we had the last Journal of Palestine Studies meeting, and I made a mention about lawfare, and uh, Camille Mansour, uh, and many lawyers don't love the law the way I, a non-lawyer, love the law. But he, Camille said that lawfare was a very bad word. He didn't want to use it. And I couldn't disagree with him more on this particular topic. Not so much because I think that litigation will save us or, you know, perhaps uh, redress the issues of war crimes and other things. But I do think that uh, particularly around certain kinds of extreme forms of violence, but for litigation, there is nothing. And so in that sense, we can't necessarily anticipate that it will save the world, but love it. Anyway, now, um, one of the things I wanted to uh, just sort of start off is say, you know, although Israel and Israeli officials have now, you know, argued that lawfare is a terrible form of delegitimization, in fact, Israel pioneered what could be called lawfare decades before the word was coined. And one can look at the way in which... Um, Israeli officials, and one I've always zoomed in on is Mer Shamgar, who actually reinterpreted, offered up this original interpretation of the ostensible inapplicability of the Geneva Conventions, in particular the Fourth Geneva Convention, to Israel's control of the West Bank and Gaza. So arguing that because those areas were not the sovereign territory of the states that had been expelled from them in 1967, therefore their status was sui generis, and while Israel is a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, it is inapplicable to Israel's control over the West Bank and Gaza. And so essentially interpreting um, Israel's rights and duties in a way that was freed from the very international law that was designed for those particular kinds of positions. And in that regard, if one thinks about how that early argument that the Fourth Geneva Convention doesn't apply, one can see, and this comes to our, the title of our panel, the idea of the human humanitarian present, that Israel, you know, in the immediate aftermath of 67 on going on, really pioneered the disconnect between humans, in this case Palestinians, and humanitarianism or humanitarian law. And so this notion that Palestinians, and Shamgar himself would say, well, the law, you know, the Geneva Conventions are not binding upon us on a de jure basis, but will abide by their humanitarian provisions without ever arguing what the humanitarian provisions were and being categorically wrong since the Geneva Conventions are humanitarian in their entirety. But that, that sort of disconnect was very critical to many other things that have come uh, along. So in some sense, you know, Palestinians who resided in the West Bank and Gaza were regarded as outside of the law because they were stateless and they were foreign to Israel. So there was a whole construction of um, Israel's rights and duties or, or lack thereof to Palestinians. Uh, in those areas. Now, that then sort of comes to the point where Israel would argue that while it's signed on to many human rights conventions, uh, it also, those are deemed to be inapplicable to its treatment of Palestinians because, you know, those parts of the occupied territories, Israel would say, are, are you know, foreign and outside of the jurisdiction. Of course, Israel's um, classic 
uh, or most well-known pioneering of a kind of lawfare, like a reinterpretation, or what I would call state lawfare, was its effort, and it's, you know, being, Israel being the first state in the world, to legalize torture. And the way in which it did so was a, you know, a classically state lawfare version. Um, now, the, what I have said is, and the United States has emulated Israel in many ways. Um, torture, the inapplicability of Geneva Conventions when you're w waging war on stateless enemies. And I refer to both um, the Israeli and then later the American interpretive innov innovations as alternative legality. And the alternative essentially is to denote that it's not that either Israel particularly or the United States officials have ignored the law, but that they've actually interpreted the law in certain ways that would bring state practice into the law as interpreted by these states. And that then becomes, I think, a very critical issue. Now, the um, the much of Israel's alternative legality has been challenged over the years, albeit very little, um, with very little success, in the Israeli High Court of Justice. I mean, there have been thousands of petitions that have come been brought into um, the Israeli High Court to challenge state policies and practices, and with rare, rare exceptions, the justices of the High Court have actually, you know, endorsed and varnished Israeli official interpretations in order to basically argue that what they are doing is uh, sort of legal and under uh, Israeli judicial interpretations. Now, I'm going to sort of move quickly into the issue of targeted killings. And well, one, actually, let me just say one specific thing, that with, you know, from 67 to the 1990s, Israel had argued that the occupied territories were not you know, occupied in a way that would uh, um, bind them to the Fort Geneva Convention. After the Israeli redeployment in the 1990s from Palestinian population centers and the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, Israel constructed a, a newer version of alternative legality, saying that somehow those areas were no longer occupied. So they'd never been occupied in the past, but now they were no longer occupied, and therefore, um, you know, it was... This becomes very significant when the second intifada begins in terms of what Israel, the way in which Israel responded to what began as, as popular uh, mass demonstrations in, in the fall, in September of 2000, 2000. And what Israel did in the immediate response to uh, the, those demonstrations was would be clearly in a non-alternative way categorical war crimes. They used tanks, helicopters, military, um, you know, gunships, like massive military force against Palestinians. The way in which they could sort of fabricate a notion of its legality was contingent on this idea that because the IDF was out of Palestinian population centers, they could no longer rely on the kind of policing tactics that they had relied on in the past, and because Palestinians, in, you know, when they referred to the police, were armed. Um, but now let me just come to the question of targeted killings. Actually, targeted killings began during the first intifada. And by targeted killings, I mean uh, sort of tactical efforts to go in and identify and kill specific Palestinians. Um, and during the first intifada, of course, Israel was absolutely categorically and unquestionably in full administrative in all forms of control over the West Bank and Gaza. So targeted killing is clearly a war crime. It's willful killing, and to the extent that it's done by Ms. Harabim, you know, Israeli soldiers or security agents who disguise themselves as Arabs, that's perfidy. Those are like straight forward war crimes. Um, you know, really not even questionable. But so Israel categorically, like torture and everything else, completely denied engaging, you know, denied, despite the huge rising body count, denied engaging in, in targeted killings. It's kind of like the United States denies engaging in drug warfare. Um, and, but the thing was that once the second intifada begins in the fall, in November, of uh, 2000, when the Tanzim begin declaring that they are actually going to engage in, you know, armed strikes. They make it an official thing to engage in armed strikes against settlers, uh, soldiers, and military bases in the West Bank and Gaza. In November of 2000, Israel targets and kills um, uh, Hussein Abayet, who was uh, considered, a, a, I think, Hamas. 
And it was the first time on that, in the immediate aftermath of that, that Israeli officials publicly acknowledged, yes, we killed this man, we targeted him. Two bystanders, that's women who were unfortunately in the street near him, were also killed. And in this discourse of war, that was just regarded as collateral damage. So between November and the end of December of 2000, targeted killing uh, escalated. Originally, just in that period of two months, Israel claimed that it would only kill, you know, Palestinian um, uh, people who were like militant uh, threats to security. But then on December 31st, 2000, uh, Thabit Thabit, who was a member of the PA, was killed. Uh, by the, and then at that point, um, the Israeli officials said, no, but no Palestinian who threatens Israeli security, not even a, a member of the PA, will be secure from that. Um, and so subsequently, many um, you know, targeted killings have continued. The most, uh, um, the most uh, infamous one occurred on July 22nd, 2002 when um, the, a leader of the military wing of Hamas, Salah Shahade, was targeted and Israel dropped a one-ton bomb on his apartment building. So Shahade and his guard were killed, as well as his entire family, 14 civilians in addition to those two. Uh, eight buildings were entirely collapsed and nine others uh, were severely damaged in that bombing and 150 people were injured. Now, in that particular case, because there was so much destruction and so much civilian death and the targeting of a, of a, a you know, a, a dense, it was in the Raj neighborhood of a building in a, in, um, in densely populated area, there was an investigation. The Israeli IDF investigated itself and then concluded that there had been no war crime committed, but, or dis, even disproportionate, but that it was unfortunate that they had had a lapse of intelligence. They were unaware of the, you know, number of civilians civilians that were around. They hadn't done the Mark Alasco <laughs> calculation properly, perhaps. So the lawfare angle. In January of 2001, uh, the wife of Thabit Thabit brought a case challenging the, the legality of the policy in the Israeli High Court of Justice. Um, and, the high, and then another case simultaneously was brought. High Court thought about it, immediately issued a statement saying, this is not a judicial justiciable matter and dismissed it. Basically saying whatever form of uh, self-defense the Israeli military chooses to use, the, the, the court is in no place. But a few uh, weeks later, before, right around that period, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel and the Palestinian um, uh, you know, human rights organization law submitted another petition challenging the disability of, or the legality of targeted killings. And in fact, the High Court reconsidered and took the case on. So it started in 2001, um, and, and shortly in 2003, Yesh Kavul, which is an Israeli organization, submitted a petition challenging the Israeli Defense Force's decision not to prosecute people responsible for the Shahade targeted killing. So, this, so the High Court suspended its consideration of the Yesh Kavul petition until it was done with the, high, um, with the targeted killing. Petition. So the High Court issued its ruling on December 15, 2006. It was written by President, who was kind of semi-retired at that point, uh, Haron Barak. Anybody who wants to sort of have a classic example of how Barak, Barak's reputation as the great liberal of Israel, can just read this decision and have a chuckle at that uh, reputation. Um, so the, the decision actually begins with this so-called factual background, which states, quote, a massive assault of terrorism was directed against the state of Israel and against Israelis merely because they are Israelis. That's how they framed the question of the legality of targeted um, killings. Now, what, it, what, this, what the decision then does is it summarizes the petitioner's positions and then the respondent's positions. The petitioner's position, that means public committee, Pekati, et cetera, says that the Israeli state has no right to militarize self-defense against an occupied population. I mean, you can't actually militarily attack civilians, you know, under the Article 51 of the UN Charter. That's it? What is it, three? Okay. Uh, and, and that, in fact, there are lesser harm ways of getting, um, of dealing with this. I mean, Israel had continued arresting and prosecuting people throughout this time. 
And, you know, the other issue is that, the, you know, the, the last element of their position was the secrecy in which this policy operates, because there are numerous um, mistakes that have been made. The state, the respondents basically first said, well, we thought that you should keep the non-just disability argument, but basically then said that this is a, um, this is a, first, you know, arguing that there's a right to do this, you know, the, the state has a right to defend itself, Palestinians are an enemy entity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that they essentially are functioning like ticking bombs, you know, that we have to kill them because they're ticking bombs. Just to skip quickly to what the, the judgment was. The judgment basically in this high court did um, what it always does, was it didn't like weigh in on the significant critical question. Are the territories occupied? Are Palestinians protected? In which case this would be categorically legal. So they refer to the areas as the area and simply make no um, other statements on that. And then they essentially conclude that targeted killings are neither categorically illegal or legal. We must always look at them retrospectively and regard whether or not there's been a proportionate use of force and so on. So in that sense, then they ask the IDF to re-analyze um, the Shahadi killing, again, in light of this decision, and the IDF basically said, yes, we come to the same conclusion. Now, I'm just, I don't even have time, but what I'm going to talk about is this touch on as points of reference. The inability to actually seek any legal justice that is meaningful and, you know, is responsive to international law in Israel has led in many different kinds of cases, but also particularly around these targeted killing cases, to the efforts to pursue justice in foreign court systems on the principle of universal jurisdiction. So there was a case, I mean, again, I'm just going to just briefly mention each thing, like on the Shahadi killing, there was litigation in the United States. Now, the United States doesn't have criminal, uh, people can't bring criminal cases, but the Center for Constitutional Rights attempted to uh, sue one of the people responsible for the Shahadi killing in the U.S. The U.S. government um, advised the court not to assert jurisdiction, and it didn't, and thereby uh, de deviating from its own position. There was an effort to um, arrest Doran al one of the Israeli military officials, at the time when he flew into Heathrow, airport, and um, there was a warrant for his arrest on the basis of the fact that he had, there was a, a file that had been prepared by the um, Palestinian Human Rights Center and uh, some lawyers in, in London. There was a warrant and police waiting to arrest him for the Shahadi bombing. The British and Israeli governments intervened, and he was allowed to stay on the plane and fly back to Israel. Similar thing happened to Moshe alone in New Zealand. But in Spain, and this will be the last point I'll make, in Spain, Spain, there was um, a very active and ongoing effort to pursue universal jurisdiction around uh, the case of, of the Shahadi killing. And it was, you know, whereas the United States pressure caused Belgium to revise its national, um, its universal jurisdiction law, it was really, according to Spanish lawyers, Israeli political pressure that had Spain sort of revise its universal jurisdiction laws. The Shahadi case moved, you know, and in fact, none of the people who are named, there's seven or eight Israeli officials, um, can go to, to Spain, because even with the narrowing of the Spanish law, one of the, the elements is you can't go after people if they're not in the country. But Israelis can now not travel to Spain, and Duran al Mog was not, you know, basically said, don't come or we're going to arrest you. Um, and in that regard, uh, you know, so the Spanish case on Shahadi may not go anywhere. But then my last point is with Operation Cast Lead, even in the um, the narrowing of the Spanish law, uh, you know, it allows the passive personality principle, meaning anybody who's Spanish or has a tie to Spain, and a thousand Gazans have Spanish nationality or residency, and so that case might very well go forward. And the very last words I would say is that the United States in its targeted killing policy, which is much more secretive than Israel's, has literally emulated the Israeli arguments for how and why, you know, killing people in a targeted manner is self-defense. And if you look at the um, expose that Charlie Savage of the New York Times wrote several months ago about the still secret um, Office of Legal Counsel memo that authorizes the president to target and kill even U.S. citizens abroad, and Anwar al was the subject 
of that. The, the argumentation is identical to what Israel had done. So that's what I meant by the laboratory. Thank <laughs> you.